Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at earthquakes and the Earth's interior. So in this video we're going to be thinking about how do we determine the location of an earthquake and its size. And this is going to correspond to section 12.6 of your textbook. So on this diagram here you can see we have an image of the United States and you can see there are several points marked on its surface. So these are going to be some seismic stations and these are you know these are locations where there are seismometers and they will measure the passage of seismic waves through the crust. Now at each of these locations of course as I say we have a a seismometer which will produce a seismogram if an earthquake occurs. Now in this particular image you can see we actually have three locations which have been picked out in particular and they are of course given uh, letter codes. So we have DUG, WUAZ and ISCO. Now these monitoring stations are going to be used by us in the next couple of images to work out the location of an earthquake. So an earthquake's occurred and for each of these three locations you can see that we have three different seismograms. Now on these seismograms we're lucky that people have picked out the first P wave to arrive and the first S wave to arrive. Now remember the greater the distance between the source of the earthquake and the monitoring station so the, the seismic station the bigger the gap between the arrival of the first P wave and the arrival of the first S wave will be. So imagine you are in two cars. You're driving one car and let's say you know, your mother's driving the other one. So you start off at the same location uh, and you start moving at the same time, but you're driving at 80 miles an hour and your mother's driving at 50. Well, obviously, over a very short distance, the cars are going to arrive at approximately the same time. So let's say you're driving towards the end of your street, the cars will arrive at pretty much the same time, even though they're moving at different speeds. However, if you would do a journey of 100 miles, well, then obviously the car that's driving faster would arrive a lot earlier than the car that's driving more slowly. And the same thing happens with seismic waves. Because the P wave is moving faster, it accelerates away. And then because the P wave is moving more slowly, it will arrive later. So the greater the distance between the source of the earthquake and the monitoring station, the bigger the gap between the first P wave to arrive and the first S wave to arrive will be. Now, as you can see on this diagram, they've actually marked out the amount of time between the arrival of the first P wave and the arrival of the first S wave. So at WUAZ, which is this one here, you can see it took 73 seconds between the first P wave arriving and the first S wave arriving. At DUG, it took 57 seconds, and at ISCO, it took 14 seconds. So as we've already discussed, this instantly tells us that ISCO is clearly closer to the earthquake than WUAZ. So that's some helpful information. Now, the nice thing is, is P waves and S waves pretty much move through the Earth's crust in a relatively consistent way. And so what we can do is we can use these, the difference between the arrival of the first P wave and the arrival of the first S wave to actually work out the distance of the monitoring station to the earthquake. So if we look at this graph here, you can see we have the three locations marked out, ISCO down here, DUG here, and WUAZ here. And this is the trend line which is going to be based on data which has been collected from multiple different earthquakes. And essentially all this graph is showing is the greater the distance, the longer, it, the longer the gap between the arrival of the first P wave and the first S wave. And we've already discussed why that is. So when we plot the uh, amount of time taken between the first P wave and the first S wave, we can use it to work out distance. So in the case of ISCO, it took 14 seconds. So that means we're going to start here, we're going to come up till we hit the trend line, then we're going to come across, and that's going to tell us that approximately um, ISCO is located about 100 kilometers from the source of the earthquake. In the case of DUG, it's 57 seconds, so it's going to be about here. We're going to come up, we're going to hit our trend line, we're going to come across, and so that's going to tell us that DUG is about 550 kilometers from the source of the earthquake. In the case of WUAZ, once again, it's 73 seconds, so we're going to be coming up somewhere around here, we're going to come up until we hit the trend line, we're going to come across, and that's telling us that uh, WUAZ is going to be about, give or take, 675 kilometers from the source of the earthquake.
So you can see we now know how far our seismic stations are from the earthquake source. Now, what are we going to do with that information? Well, we're going to go to a map. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw essentially a line because this value here represents the radius of a circle. So we know DUG is, so let's, yeah, we know DUG is here. Okay. And we know from this graph that DUG is going to be about 550 kilometers from the source of the earthquake. The problem is, is we don't know in which direction that 550 kilometers is. So was the earthquake over here? Was the earthquake over here? Was the earthquake here or was the earthquake here? All the seismogram is telling us that there was an earthquake 550 kilometers away. So on its own, the data that we've collected from DUG says the earthquake must be somewhere along the edge of the circle. Remembering the radius of the circle is 550 kilometers. Now, on its own, that's not particularly helpful, is it? However, if we take data from three different seismic stations and we plot the possible locations of the earthquakes, we can actually get an accurate location. So you can see in the case of WUAZ, the radius of the circle is going to be about 675 kilometers. So the distance from here to this line here is 675 kilometers. And so we've drawn a circle, so it could be 675 in any direction from the monitoring station. And so you can see that the circle for DUG and the circle for WUAZ overlap in two locations, here and here. So this is the two possible locations where our earthquake could be occurring. Okay. Now, is there, is there any other information? Well, yes, of course, we have the information from the ISCO monitoring station. Now, in the case of ISCO, the distance to the earthquake is only about 100 kilometers. So you can see the radius is a lot smaller and therefore so is the circle. And so what we can do is if we draw the radius, the circle for ISCO, then we can see that each circle, the circle for WUAZ, DUG and ISCO all overlap right here. And this is going to be the location of our earthquake. So this is how we use seismograms to locate the epicenter of our earthquake. Remembering, of course, that the epicenter is the point on the Earth's surface, which is directly above the hypercenter. The hypercenter is actually where the earthquake occurs. So in order to accurately work out the location of an earthquake, you must have a minimum of three seismic stations that detect the earthquake. You can't do it with two, you can't do it with one, you need a minimum of three. And when you take the seismograms from these seismic stations, you measure the interval between the arrival of the first P wave and the arrival of the first S wave. You then use that interval, you apply it to a graph like this, that's how you get the distance. Remembering the distance represents the radius, and then you simply use a map, you draw the circle using the radius you've just worked out using the graph here, and you look and see where the circles overlap. And that gives you the exact location of your earthquake. So it's actually a relatively simple process. So the next question is, is, well, how do we actually measure the size of earthquakes? Now, the most common method for measuring the size of earthquakes is the Richter scale. And the Richter scale is a, an effective tool for measuring the size of earthquakes, but it does have problems. So there are other methods that are occasionally used, but the one you will be most familiar with, the one you will have heard on the news, will be the Richter scale. So the question becomes is, well, how do we actually work out the size, the intensity of an earthquake? Well, we use the amplitude of the seismic wave. So here we have ourselves a seismogram. So we, you can see we have our background over here. Here we have the arrival of the first wave. This is going to be the arrival of the P wave. Then as you can see, the P waves initially are quite intense and then the amplitude drops down. And then we have the arrival of the S waves. And so in order to work out the Richter scale of Richter magnitude, what we're going to do is we're going to measure the maximum amplitude. And in this case, this is going to be associated with the S waves. And so normally we'll use the S wave amplitude to work out the Richter magnitude. So we're going to measure the amplitude of our wave and how are we going to use that information? Well, you can see we're going to use a graph that looks like this. So on this axis here, on this line here, you can see we have distance. Now we worked out the distance using the previous slide. So if we just go back for a second, you can see we worked out the distance using a graph like this. 
Now, on the other side, we have the amplitude. Now, this is in millimeters, and we'll simply take the magnitude by measuring off the seismogram. Now, we will have to do a small conversion as well, but we're not going to worry about that right now. So, you know, for all intents and purposes, just imagine that the amplitude is just measured off the graph. So we have two pieces of information. We have the distance of our monitoring station from our earthquake, and we have the amplitude of the largest S wave on our seismogram. And so all we do is we simply draw a line between those two locations. So if we just go back for a second, you'll notice that when we look at these seismograms, what do we see? Well, we can see that in terms of the magnitude, the S wave, ISCO has quite clearly the largest magnitude. And then we can see DUG has a slightly smaller magnitude and, and uh, WUAZ has the smallest magnitude here. And so obviously that means that in terms of amplitude, ISCO is going to have the highest and WUAZ is going to have the smallest. Now, we also know in terms of distance, WAZ was furthest away and ISCO was closest. And so what we're going to do for ISCO, we're going to draw a point between the distance, which we got from the graph on the previous slide, and the magnitude, which we measured from the seismogram. We're going to draw a line joining those two points together. We're going to do the same for WUAZ, and we're going to do the same for DUG. And then we're going to look at where these lines intersect along this central axis, and this is the Richter magnitude. And so where our lines intersect, that is the magnitude of our earthquake. And so in this case, the magnitude of our earthquake is about 4.1 4 on the Richter scale. So you can see that locating earthquakes and getting their magnitude is not actually a particularly complicated process. You just need to make sure you have a minimum of free monitoring stations that produce you know, nice clear seismograms that you can take measurements from. All right, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.